hello, and welcome to our Fall 2024 Conversations That Matter series. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who are returners, welcome back. We're glad you're back. As you know, every semester, the McGrath Institute hosts a series of conversations around a topic of relevance to human dignity in the Catholic intellectual tradition and pastoral life. In light of the upcoming elections, our two episode fall series will take up the fundamental question, how can the Eucharist transform our understanding of politics? In today's conversation, we'll discuss how reimagining and reorienting politics eucharistically can radically change our understanding of our role as Catholics and Christians in public life. So the need for a renewal of imagination is, is clear in, in the realm of politics. Nearly two thirds of Americans say they feel somewhat or always exhausted um, when they think about politics. Another 55% say they often or always feel angry. Um, and perhaps most telling of all, only 10% say they feel hopeful when they think about politics. So certainly these are not fruits of the Holy Spirit. So compare these sentiments of what Americans feel when they think about and engage in the political to what popes have said about the role of politics. Um, pope Benedict has said that the Eucharist should transform every aspect of our lives, the personal, the social, and the political. And Pope Francis and Evangelium Gaudium wrote that Politics remains a lofty vocation, one of the highest forms of charity, um, and that as such, it should be um, considered a, a vocation of true value. So he writes, and he quotes Pope Benedict here, we need to be convinced that charity is the principle of not only micro relationships, so relationships with our, our friends and our family, but also our macro relationships, our relationships in the social, political, and economic sphere. So it's clear there's a disconnect between Americans' fractious experience of politics and our Eucharistic mission in the world. So to help us to think about this topic, we've asked three wonderful panelists um, to join us today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them now. F. De Carlos Blackman is the Vice Chancellor for Pastoral Services um, in the Archdiocese of Louisville. His work fosters communities rooted in charity, justice, and peace, and solidarity, ensuring a culture directed towards the proper goal of forming people to build a civilization of love for the common good. Bob Dunn is the Director of Public Policy for the Statewide Diocese of Manchester, New Hampshire. Bob is a graduate of Georgetown University Law and the College of Holy Cross. He's also one of the McGrath Institute's uh, inaugural class of Mathis liturgical leaders. And Holly Taylor Coleman is an assistant professor of theology at Providence College. Her areas of interest focus on polarization, the family, and law. So I want to thank our uh, panelists for joining us. If you're interested in reading the panelists' full bios, you can read them on our website. So our format today will be conversational. I will moderate our conversation, posing some framing questions for our panelists. Um, they will engage with one another. And for our final 10 to 15 minutes, we will uh, engage your live Q&A questions. So if you have a question at any point throughout the webinar, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A feature um, on your screen. So with that, I'll go ahead and launch us off. So, um, so a recent survey, same research I was citing before in which um, Bao Dunn also cites in an article he recently wrote for Church Life Journal, uh, recent research conducted by Pew indicates that Americans are deeply polarized. Um, the researchers note that fewer people um, hold a mix of liberal and conservative beliefs than they did in the past. And both Democrats and Republicans express hostility toward the other party, describing members of the opposing party as more dishonest, more immoral, and more closed-minded than other Americans. Um, so I'd like to sort of throw this out, our first question to Holly. Holly, can you sort of give us some theological and philosophical foundations for understanding our present moment of deep 
friction and polarization? Sure. I think that um, it's interesting because polarization has become a topic of conversation in many locations, inside and outside the church. Um, There's certain facts that are indisputable, but um, I would say there's a lot of disagreement about how that works and what it is. And so I think it's actually important to just take a moment and say what it is that um, I mean when I use the phrase polarization and where I think that there is a, a framework that really allows us to see a damaging dynamic at work. Um, maybe I could start by saying what polarization is not. I don't think that we should imagine that polarization is conflict. I don't think we should imagine polarization is sharp conflict, conflict with a personal stake in the issues at hand, um, or in any way, a deep commitment to work toward um, some position or state of affairs that we believe is important. Polarization, in some ways, I think it actually helps to go back to the uh, original metaphor that comes from physics. You can imagine a kind of uh, a magnet that has two poles. And everything is drawn to one or the other. So um, it's certainly the case that the two poles are different from one another. In fact, they're precisely opposite. But um, rather than starting with conflict, I think what we should say is this. Polarization is a process in which everything ends up being drawn to one of two possible poles. It's always two. Um, and when I say everything, I really mean everything. I've seen, I think we've seen in in, in recent years even more the way that um, what magazines you read and what chicken you eat uh, has to do with which, <laughs> which poll mm-hmm. um, you are committed to. It's the insistence that everything must be assigned to a poll. It's the insistence that everything at that mm-hmm. poll is in fact deeply interconnected, whether that's the case or not. And finally, it's the insistence that those two poles uh, are constituted precisely as opposites of the other. Mm -hmm. So it does, in fact, in that worldview, make a lot of sense to say that if something doesn't uh, fit well into one pole, it belongs to the other. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can picture that magnetic pull, I just think we have seen that become stronger and stronger, tighter and tighter, um, and many implications insofar as that's uh, personal and not just just magnets that we're talking about. Um, I would note, for example, that um, we have seen increasing instances in which any suggestion of a failure to exhibit perfect loyalty to one of those poles constitutes a commitment to the other pole, Mm. which simply on logical terms is a very puzzling claim. But Mm. if you keep in mind this account of polarization, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would start with that. And I would say, um, I'll just add one other um, observation here, which I, I think other panelists will be well equipped to comment on. Um, there's a problem in that system. I think I think there is actually a problem for everyone involved, but there are problems for Catholics or for anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ in that um, it just turns out that the teachings of Jesus and the larger tradition of the Catholic Church do not fit well mm-hmm. into the two polls that have been established in 2024 in the United States of America. Um, and so Catholics constantly uh, and other Christians find themselves in a caught up in a set of forces that do not work well mm-hmm. for them and do not best allow them to carry out um, their own deepest commitments and convictions. Holly, thank you. I I love that image of the magnet as sort of a base image for thinking about polarization and everything in our lives, not just the political, but all of our choices getting 
suck into one of those two ends. I'd like to invite our other panelists uh, into the conversation, Bob, DeCarlos, to respond, expand, continue uh, Holly's comments. You no, know, from my perspective, and I, I appreciate uh, Holly's comments, uh, I think we have to hang our hats on the certain reality that no particular poll encompasses all of what we believe. And we dupe ourselves into thinking that any one particular side holds a monopoly on all that is true and correct. I think um, when we consider where we were, uh, I guess the last couple of decades, but we remember after 2016, you know, we had people in their respective families who were not speaking with one another, but yet somehow participating in the Sunday Eucharist as the holiest people in the communion line. So I think that we need to make sure as we move forward that we don't try to lean towards one side or the other, but there, that we are looking objectively at what it means to be about the dignity of every person. You know, quite simply, how do we call ourselves pro-life or pro-justice if we cannot manage to respect the folks to the left and right of us every day? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carlo. Yeah, I <clears throat> I agree with everything that's just been said, and and uh, Holly's remarks I think really uh, hit on a lot of the nuances that we need to understand uh, by way of her introduction. Um, let's think about how this polarization, or I think another way to term it is hyper-partisanship, um, seeps into the church. We see that when people look at their faith through the lens of their politics, we see it when people adopt much of the substance and the style of what they see in the secular political world. Uh, in what they do and in their manner of discourse. And so mm -hmm. what does the Eucharist tell us about that? The Eucharist says, you can't imitate that stuff. We can't imitate that stuff. We're supposed to be witnesses to the risen Lord, credible witnesses. And if mm -hmm. we imitate all of the worst aspects of modern political culture, then we're going to be counter witnesses and we will be incredible witnesses. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back to what the Eucharist tells us. And that is, uh, of course, that it is the sacrament of communion. It is the antithesis of polarization. Communion with God, communion with other Catholics, communion with every other human being. Um, and so it's a call also to solidarity. Uh, Pope Benedict, in his apostolic exhortation, uh, the sacrament of charity, said that the Eucharist calls us to see all other human beings as brothers and sisters whom Jesus loved to the end. I can't imagine anything that would be more uh, contrary to what modern political culture is like mm -hmm. and how transformative it would be if we started to approach other people in the public square as brothers and sisters whom Jesus loved to the end. The other thing about uh, polarization or hyperpartisanship that really stands out for me is the fact that it produces the levels of despair that Jess was talking about in the introduction. If we imitate the ways of modern political culture, then we are simply contributing to this endless cycle of partisanship, hyper-partisanship, I should say, and polarization and despair. But if we bring the fruits of the Eucharist into the public square, then 
we will be bringers of hope and we'll be carrying out uh, as the first letter of Peter says, always be ready to give a reason for this hope of yours. Uh, by modeling this new way of political engagement that is based on the fruits of the Eucharist, then we'll be bringers of hope to the body politic. And that's a tremendous gift that we can uh, give to folks as Catholics. Mm hmm yeah, I think one of the most telling um, features of American po political life is the lack of hope it inspires. And precisely as Christians, we are called to be a people of hope. I want to just address a, a question that might be arising for some people um, when they hear us talking about sort of the Eucharist transforming political life. It doesn't mean that there's no disagreement so can you sort of speak to that relationship? Some people hear Eucharistic transformation um, or hear the ways we're talking about American political discourse and they're thinking, well, that means there has to be no disagreement if they equate polarization with conflict and disagreement. And so how does, how does sort of spirited disagreement fit within for this, what we're talking about? And then, and then I want to dive into the specific question of how the Eucharist can transform our conception of politics. I could just say a quick word about that, Jess. Um, I think you are making an extremely important point. Again, sometimes it comes back to some pretty fundamental definitions of um, terms. I think even when we don't mean to, we can mm -hmm. hear a call to radical love as a call to not make a fuss, not to make mm -hmm. any too angry or feel uncomfortable. Um, even those of us who, if you pressed us, we would say something different. And so I, I want to say that I think that your remark opens up a door to uh, a really important call to us right now, which is to press into that difficult work and to make sense of what it looks like um, what I would say, you know, what real love looks like, um, which is something very different than being nice or not ruffling feathers. Um, and, you know, anytime that we're trying to imagine something or enact it practically really helps to look at models. I know that I myself have been deeply informed uh, by the work of Martin Luther King Jr., the form of nonviolent resistance that he both recommended and also um, took up himself. Um, King, Kingian nonviolence is, is a framework of practice mm -hmm. that many folks are taking very seriously, looking at the detail, what does that look like? How do you do that? Um, and of course we have to say King himself deeply informed by Jesus teachings and mm -hmm. the gospels. Um, and, and so without, you know, moving into the details of what Kingian and nonviolence looks like, I just want to offer that model. What does it mean um, for us to do something like what King does when he says our sisters and brothers are engaged in practices that are evil and that must end. We mm -hmm. cannot, support these practices. In fact, we are called to disavow them. But our goal, our goal is befriending those who are engaged in those practices. Um, and that's going to change how we do everything mm -hmm. from the word go. Uh, there are other possibilities as well, but I would just say we have to take that very seriously and not send folks off with only um vague suggestions to love, but allow for disagreement. I think something much more um, radical is called for there. Something much more substantial. Yeah. Thank you, Holly. To Carlos, yeah. I see you wanting to come in. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate everything that Holly said, because this is in part, what she said is in part why it's important to bring our faith to the public square. It's a fundamental expression of how we share God's love for each other. So we cannot turn a blind eye, even when we know people are going to disagree with us. Mm -hmm. This is how we work towards building a civilization of love. You know, it's important for us to be reminded and to remind each other of the responsibility 
to love others as God lavishes love on every one of us. We are reminded by Pope Benedict and Pope Francis that the just ordering of society and of the state is a central responsibility of politics. And we, the whole people of God, cannot be on the sidelines in the fight for justice. So this is why I say very often, we cannot pretend to be the holiest people in the communion line, but yet turn a blind eye to the totality of the gospel of life. Not one particular angle or someone's uh, particular perspective, but we got to do it all. So I, 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 I'm always in love with what Holly has to say. So there you have it. <laughs> So I want to dig in now to, to precisely what it looks like to imagine a Eucharistic transformation of politics. So 2024 is not only an election year, but it is also the year in which the church held its first national Eucharistic Congress in over 80 years. I think the last one was in 1941. And we don't often ponder this relationship between the Eucharist and politics, but these two events being sort of side by side helps us to do so. So I want to invite our panelists to all reflect on how we understand that relationship. I think we've started to talk about it um, and what it would mean, what it would look like for the Eucharist to transform our practice of politics. What are some principles we can think about and, and sort of stakes in the ground we can we can hold on to in this conversation. Well, I think if I can jump in, um, we tend to not think about there being any relationship between the Eucharist and politics. I think that we often, um, when we conceive of the church's mission in the public square, if we conceive of it at all, it is as being about discrete political issues. And more often than not, it's one or two or three discrete political issues chosen according to the taste of the person that is making that choice. And um, so one of the most uh, essential things that we have to recapture is the idea that the Eucharist calls us to the transformation of every aspect of our human existence. And that's what Pope Benedict said in the Sacrament of Charity and Jess talked about that in her introduction. And obviously, one of the uh, aspects of our human existence that is sorely in need of transformation is the world of politics. So what would it look like if our politics were reimagined around the Eucharist. And I think it's uh, one effective way to, to consider that is by looking at how a Eucharistically informed politics would look compared to what the prominent features of modern political culture are like. We've talked about hyper-partisanship and polarization already. One other that I think is one of the most prominent features of modern politics is radical individualism. The idea that we need to advance our own self-interest, that my own self-interest outweighs the interests of other people or of the common good. And that is something which is everywhere you look in modern society. The Eucharist, on the other hand, forms us in exactly the opposite direction. The Eucharist forms us uh, to be people that are attentive to other people. As Pope Benedict said in Deus Caritas Est, that the Eucharist, in the Eucharist, we enter into the very dynamic of Jesus' self-giving and self-offering. Um, Pope Francis, in the, the quote that uh, Jess or someone mentioned earlier um, said that uh, politics is one of the highest forms of charity because it seeks the common good. And that is an incredibly countercultural statement because we tend to look at politics and charity as being 
diametrically opposed to one another. So one of the ways that we are going to transform the 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 political world in the Eucharist, I believe, is that we're going to bring politics and charity back together again uh, and try to ensure that people understand that that if we're going to do our politics eucharistically, then we need to do the things that Jesus did. Heal the sick, welcome the outcast, uh, be a uh, a person who is full of mercy and forgiveness. And in the end, um, I think that we're, as Catholics, going to be successful in doing this transformation only if we come to the conclusion that politics is one essential way that we carry out the Lord's command that we wash one another's feet. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Holly. Um, I, I think Bob is leading us in such rich directions here. I feel like I want to get the recording of that, this, this, this session, just listen to that again. I mean, I know these things, but I just feel like we're in a moment where we really need to have those repeated for us and let them soak in. Mm -hmm. Um, just a couple quick thoughts from me. Um, I am so appreciative of, of Bob's emphasis on the way that, um, we 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 come to faith before we come to politics, or I guess if you were going to talk about it very specifically with reference to the altar, um, you could say we don't come to the Eucharist um, simply to be reinforced or supported. Um, and it's, it's right, it's right that we should talk about the Eucharist as a form of nourishment, etc. But um, we have to also keep in mind um, the claim, you know, we hear it first from Augustine and then through um, Pope Benedict as well, that the Eucharist is as radical as you become what you consume. Um, and that is the story of our being um, undone as well as done. Mm. <laughs> it's a story of us being called to... Um, to transformation and to reconsideration. I, I want to just say too, a very simple point, I suppose, but the, the way in which the, the Eucharist is a rhythmic and regular part of our life, I think in and of itself calls us to a posture of um, humility and, and openness. Um, and again, it may be a very simple point, but you know, we, we don't, we don't only come to the Eucharist to eat. We come to the Eucharist to be fed. And I think that too, if we took the time to really grasp what that means, it would it would draw us both toward humility and also, uh, sorry, both toward humility and also toward a vulnerability, a sense that, you know, it's an important part of this account of the common good, that we're dependent uh, on others. Um, I think um, there, there are probably many more um, practical things to be said. Um, but uh, I'll just say this for now. I want to hear from De Carlos also, but um, as I was listening to Bob talking, I was also thinking how important it is that we have um, perhaps a richer account of what politics mm -hmm. are than we have. As I was thinking about politics as a, as a location for love, as an opportunity for love, I think it's really important that we not get caught up in sometimes an unspoken tendency to imagine um, politics as being comprised of these every four year mm -hmm. uh, mud wrestling matches. <laughs> um, you know, politics, especially if you go to the root, politics is what has to do with the polis the good of the city. And so politics is working with um, fellow parents at your, uh, at your local public school. Politics is working on um, land preservation in the state that you work on. Politics is caucusing and, and having conversations and 
um, as well as everything related to elections and campaigning. Um, so just to say that quick word, I think the more that that understanding expands, the more we see all the possibilities for love. Yeah, I definitely agree uh, with each of you in just looking at um, approaching the November elections. None of us should be duped into, as Holly said, uh, just about uh, receiving communion, uh, taking communion. But I think it's important for us to be in communion with one another. So as we talk about politics and campaigning, all of that requires us to be in relationship uh, with another. So I think as we approach the November elections, seeing that we are bombarded with extensive rhetoric about this candidate worthy of our votes and that candidate, remember that we are a Eucharistic people, that we are concerned for each other. And as we form our consciences, we must remember that we got to respect, defend, and promote the dignity of every human person at every moment and in every condition of that person's life. So we can't say, oh, I'm pro-life, but then I can disregard the people to the left and right of us every day because they don't matter. This is the most important mm -hmm. issue. Well, all of those issues are important. And we know that because the Eucharist is what's supposed to bind us together, you know, these sacraments of initiation. So uh, we have to be genuine. We have to be authentic. We have to be reminded all the time by one another that God's given us inestimable dignity. That can never be taken away. If we believe that the gospel of life is the core of the church's social teaching, we got to strive arduously not only to preserve and protect life after conception, but to nurture and respect life at every stage until natural death. So mm -hmm. it's not, well, we do this, but this is not as important. It's all important. The person before me is important. So our uh, concept of the Eucharist has to be not just, or, or communion, not just going in the communion line to receive, but how are we on the portico before Mass, uh, on the portico of the church mm -hmm. after Mass, how we are on the ball field, how we are when someone cuts us off on the interstate, you know, when someone tells us what we don't want to hear, because justice is inseparable from charity and intrinsic to it. That's very important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So as a, a people of the Eucharist, I think Eucharistic revival is amazing. But let us never forget that those who disagree with us, they're also ours. And we're in this together. We're journeying together but let's not shirk our responsibilities to love and to be charitable, even as we need to encounter. I think Pope Francis has done a very good job in talking about encounter and accompaniment, but sometimes we can fall into the trap, into the tempter snare that our own rhetoric causes people to question whether we even believe what we are saying when our actions are contrary to that. Yeah, thank you. These all have, I mean, we could take any one of your comments and mine them further for a few hours. Um, I think this expanded notion of politics is really critical. And I think all of our, all three of you have spoken to that in some way um, that the work of political engagement, the work of a Eucharistic transformation of politics doesn't start or end on November 5th. Um, that there are, it's a form of life and a practice um, of inhabiting our communities, our workspaces, our state and, and national uh, political bodies. And 
the bishop's document forming faithful uh, consciences for for voting speaks exactly, I think, to, to Carlos, to what you're saying about the need to bring the whole gospel of life to bear, the need that not every person has to work on every issue. That is impossible, but that we have a community of people who are committed together um, to the gospel of life, to the fullness of the gospel of life. So I want to, I want to have time to get to some practicals. So uh, this is, this will be sort of our last, or maybe this is our practical moves us into the practicals. My sense is that our current way of doing politics leaves most people feeling profoundly unfree. Okay, so, and what do I mean by unfree? I mean, unfree interiorly, unfree to act in our neighborhoods and communities, unfree through anger, that we are, we are bound um, and, and not free to live out the fullness of the Eucharistic mission of the church in the public space. So if we were trying to, you know, name some of the fruits of our uh, current politics, words like hopelessness, anger, mockery, spitefulness come to mind. Um, so there, these are not fruits of the spirit, as I mentioned earlier. So as we think about the transformation of politics, how, what does a Eucharistic reorientation of our understanding of politics free us for positively? I, I think that uh, Catholic social teaching is uh, the, just exactly what it is that you described. Uh, a Eucharistic politics would be based on the entirety of Catholic social teaching. If we take Catholic social teaching only in a fragmentary manner, then we're going to be conceiving of politics as... Uh, being consistent with whatever political party reflects the one or two issues that are really important to us. Um, mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, we look at Catholic social teaching as it is intended to be taken, as an integral whole, as a coherent, consistent, logically persuasive whole, then we're uh, moving into new territory. And uh, I can tell you just from my own personal experience, when I go to the New Hampshire State House, the thing I love most about my job is uh, being able to walk into hearings where people wouldn't necessarily expect the Catholic Church to be, or yeah. to uh, walk into hearings where we might be uh, doing something that would be a sort of Republican-y type of thing in the morning and a Democratic-y thing. I'm using technical terminology here. Absolutely, um, yeah. In the afternoon. And, um, and that illustrates to me just what our work in the public square has to be alike. It cannot be in aid of the partisan interests of one political party or another. As I think somebody mentioned already today, Catholic social teaching is the square peg that does not fit into the round hole of American party politics. And um, that is the way out, I think. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways, on a lot of issues, the uh, the two sides on that issue are sitting there in their trenches looking at each other like it was the Western Front in 1916. And mm -hmm. there's no escape from that. It's just going to be the same day after day after day. Mm -hmm. Catholic social teaching and a Eucharistic approach is the sort of game changer that can draw correspondences between issues so that people can see that, for instance, the human dignity of the young human being in the womb is inseparable from the human dignity of the young human being at the border, or the young human being who's homeless, or the young human being who needs health care. And so uh, those are ways that people can look at issues in a different light 
and uh, maybe break out of the stalemate and the despair that clearly exists in the political world today? Well, I, I have to say, Jess, I agree uh, totally uh, with Bob. As he was speaking, I was thinking how it is the responsibility of, and, and I've reminded in previous dioceses I've been in, that those with uh, preaching faculties have a responsibility to help the Christian faithful to fully form their consciences, but not, not to uh, tell people for whom to vote. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes this is what happens, and it's incredibly uh, damaging to uh, everybody when someone decides that, well, this is how you have to do it. But I think the primacy of conscience is really, really important. But priests, bishops, uh, deacons in preaching, they are obliged to teach the truth to aid in the formation of consciences with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. This is what we believe. But what we cannot do, and, and this is uh, what I say to those with preaching faculties all the time, we cannot allow people to fall into the temptation of broadly disparaging any particular party or group because they disagree with our views. We should not find ourselves demonizing or using scripture and church teaching to antagonize those whose views differ from our own. That is not how our Lord would have brought about the encounter that got people to the point where they were transformed. So if we're going to be Eucharistic people, I mean, I think there's a lot of positive moving forward, but when we fall into the tempter snare, it does much more harm than good. There is far more that unites us than what divides us. So I think looking at the totality of the gospel of life and the church's social teaching would do us well living authentically and moving forward towards joyful hope. You know, if I could just press a little bit in the same direction, actually, that, that both of these um, sets of comments have gone, I would say this. Insofar as we do engage in a number of ways in partisan politics, um, Catholics do and will engage in partisan. Mm -hmm. A Catholic may choose to vote for the candidate of one party over another. A Catholic may choose to campaign uh, in their, not as a preacher, but in their private life. Um and I think just to say very explicitly what we have been sort of saying between the lines, what a Eucharistic life means is precisely that those commitments are always relative commitments. Mm -hmm. They're always provisional commitments, and they should be carried forward with our eyes wide open about the way in which even the party for whom we have decided to, to whom we've decided to offer support is not the gospel itself. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think Catholics particularly, I would say, need to be clear about where both of the parties are in fact getting things wrong. Now, so I mean, what I mean to say is I don't, I don't mean to rule out action. Um, we, you know, it is uh, our Lord himself who said we should be as cunning as serpents and as wise as doves. <laughs> and I think part of what that means is that we do take actions. We we engage in careful and prudential um, discernment about that. And it is possible to say that in this case, for these reasons, I will support this Republican candidate. Or even to say broadly, I have come to a moment where I support in general the Republican Party more, more so than I do the Democratic Party. Um, but that can never uh, merge into some kind of ultimate commitment mm -hmm. that doesn't involve criticism. And in fact, one thing I would say, one of the very practical implications is what that's going to mean is that Catholics who do end up in that position should certainly assume that one of their chief political responsibilities will be inside the party with whom they identify to be raising questions mm -hmm. and concerns and critiques the, and be clear about that. Yeah, I, 
I, I think that is such an important point. Um, I I brought this with an intention to quote from it, and it says exactly what Hawley is saying. This is from Section 573 of the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. And this is an often neglected paragraph in an often neglected book. Um, but this is hugely critical, uh, and this really captures the mission of Catholics in the public square in between the two elections. You know, we think of Catholic social teaching as being applicable usually in the month of October every four years, but it is applicable across the board. And this is what this sentence says. Uh, Christians' adherence to a political alliance will never be ideological, but always critical. In this way, the party and its political platform will be prompted to be ever more conscientious in attaining the true common good, including the spiritual end of the human person. And there it is. The common good is the goal. Um, it's not the perpetuation of the power of one party or another. It's not the advancement of one's own self-interest, but it is our work as Catholics in the public square, both as individuals and working on an institutional, even political party level, to advance the common good. That's the goal. Thank, I want to thank you both. I think that's a really helpful clarification of how Catholics not only should think about voting, but should think about participation in our current politics as it is um, in a particular and, dare I say, peculiar way um, that the Eucharist makes everything else relative, all of our other commitments relative. Um, and presses upon us to constantly be discerning in light of um, that sacrificial love into which we're formed. Um, I want to I want to move to audience Q and A here momentarily, but I want to maybe I'll save this question actually till the end. Um, so our first question, um, I'm going to actually quote the whole comment, uh, says, I find myself nodding in vehement agreement. Then I noticed I was assuming that you were clearly talking to people on the other side, um, not to me. So how do we test ourselves um, to make sure that we are taking this imperative to heart and not deflecting it to the others who clearly need to change? What kind of self-examination do each of us need to be doing? You can, I think Bob's recommendation of the compendium of Catholic social thought is a great one. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Catholics are called to self scrutiny as a, just an ongoing practice of life. And uh, maybe one thing we, we all need to do at this point is sit with the compendium, <laughs> just mm -hmm. uh, meditate on this vision of life together um, because it is one that is, um, strange to uh, mm -hmm. certainly life in the U.S. Yeah, I remember many parishes now pray the St. Michael prayer, introducing that prayer at the end of Mass again. And I remember a moment when it changed for me when, you know, I'm not asking only for St. Michael to protect me from things out there, but to protect me from things going on in here. Um, to defend, in some ways, me from my worst instincts. Um, I think that's really helpful to, to this call. Perhaps this is something we can do in the weeks leading up to the election, sitting with portions of the compendium um, in our personal prayer. Uh, Bob and DeCarlos, I want to make sure you have space to come in if you'd like to add anything. Well, I, you know, I I agree with uh, what Holly was saying, so I don't want to uh, try to revise or extend anything in that regard. But as I was listening uh, to Holly and even comments that Bob said earlier, which I think address this, each of us has to remember that we don't hold a monopoly on everything that's true and correct. 
very often we're looking at the other person to kind of decide as to how correct they are. But, you know, I think sometimes if we're not doing that self-examination of ourselves, we are not really working towards the more difficult right. Sometimes, you know, when we're not examining ourselves, we are falling into the temptation of the easy wrong of indifference. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to make sure that we're constantly looking at ourselves critically. So just to your point, praying the St. Michael's Prayer, it's very often that, you know, with different prayers after liturgies, we're talking about everything outside of us, but sometimes, again, what's defiling is what's inside. So I think we have to be uh, mindful of that as well. Right. We we start off the liturgy by talking about what we have done and what we have failed to do. So yes. we Catholics, above everyone else, presumably in the public square, in some respects, um, should be well aware of the need for us to be humble and to be aware of our own shortcomings and to um, and to approach other people in our discussions with them in a way that is uh, calculated to persuade rather than to antagonize. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're just part, of, one of the great gifts I think that the council gave us was Dignitatis Humanae because it, uh, it really restored uh, a, a situation where the church was part of the marketplace of ideas. We could no longer rely on saying, you should agree with us because we're the Catholic Church. Instead, we need to explain the reason for this hope of ours, to, uh, to try to persuade other people and to be credible witnesses by, uh, as Pope Benedict says, I think it's in the Sacrament of Charity, uh, to be credible witnesses by our by what we say, what we do, and by our very way of being. And uh, so if we act towards other people, even people that we disagree with, in a way that is truly Christ-like, then we stand a chance of bringing them mm -hmm. to Christ. Mm -hmm. If we don't act in a way that is Christ-like, then they're not going to encounter Christ through us. So it's a pretty simple proposition, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and just, I, I want to follow up just by saying that uh, as Bob was talking, it, it's not, I just don't think that we're going to win people uh, to Christ by going through the door with a battering ram. I, I think that necessary encounter genuinely will provide opportunities for accompaniment. And sometimes it is worth it to explain to people how we came to our own understanding. And when we are offering correction to someone, we should probably do it in view of our own faults and failings. Mm -hmm. you, you know, these personality tests are multiplied by the dozens say that you can take. There's one that struck me. Um, there's a personality type called the wooer. So you woo people to your position. It strikes me that Catholics have the unique opportunities to be wooers um, in our context today. Um, I want to, there, this is a question that has both a million answers and no answers, but I'd like each of you to speak to briefly, very briefly, all too briefly, how you would explain the common good um to to our audience and for our audience to explain that to others what it, what are we talking about when we talk about the common good i'll just say briefly that i think there's a need for a a distinction <clears throat> because i think there's a pretty strong tendency especially in the in the us to go in a very pragmatic direction mm -hmm. and say something like, um, you know, the best that we can manage or something like that. Um, <clears throat> um, and I, I'm, I'm sure that um, the other panelists have more to say on this, but 
um, you know, the common good is the good of all and the good of each individual mm -hmm. in that good. Now, again, I just think this is not a way that we are practiced in thinking. We assume that those two goods are, of course, opposed to each other uh, right. in reality. Um, and so I guess I would just say this. Um, there is a real need here for us to um, seek a conversion of imagination on this question. Um, it's not either one of those things. It is keeping an eye both to the whole and also to each individual in that whole as um, a creature of God with um, limitless value. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I do believe that it is about all and each. It is about all and each. But I think we also have to remember not to be so focused in on what is aesthetically pleasing to me as I'm working to uh, working towards the common good. Because I think sometimes when we claim to be working towards the common good, we are working from the perspective that I hold the monopoly on everything that's true and correct. And if you do it my way, then that is the good for all, because this is the way I would want it. That is the common good. I think we do fall into the trap. People, I think it's uh, maybe it's the human condition, but people, you know, I, what I know is, is the way that it should be. So I think that when we're focusing on working towards the common good, it is a matter of all and each. And we get there by meaningful encounter with one another. If I don't desire encounter with you to see what your needs are, meeting you where you are at whatever state of life you are, that's going to be problematic. So again, I think common good, the all and the each. Bob, one, one thing I would add is that we think about the common good as a religious principle, which it certainly is. It's one of the four foundation stones of Catholic social teaching. But it's also uh, the foundation stone of our body politic as well. It's recognized as such in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution, which says that one of the reasons this constitutional republic was being established was to promote the general welfare. And a, there's a similar provision in the New Hampshire State Constitution and a number of others. So uh, even though uh, the common good certainly has not always been honored in the secular body politic, it is certainly the aspiration of the body politic. Mm -hmm. And so the common good is an interesting piece of common ground, so to speak, where we can engage in a conversation with the secular body politic in an area which is uh, common to both the body politic and to the body of Christ. Thanks, Bob. Um, our time for this really rich and fascinating conversation is coming to an end. I want to ask our panelists one light more lightning question so what is the one resource or idea practice you would recommend to people right now in their parishes or schools um, where do we start what is the one thing you would do today or recommend reading today um, we'll just go lightning round I, I would say the compendium I really would. I think adult faith formation at all intergenerational formation, we need to dig deeply into that. I think that's going to help us to get to this idea of the totality of the gospel of life. Great. I would encourage folks to look for a small group of fellow Catholics, wherever they can find that group and read, um, the document comes from the U.S. bishops forming faithful consciences. Mm -hmm. Just read it together and uh, talk about it. 
Uh, and those are all great suggestions. And I would add one, uh, I'd add the Sacrament of Charity by Pope Benedict. Um, that we've been talking about a lot here because that situates the Eucharist at the center of all of this. So uh, I feel as if our our the the perspectives we have on the Eucharist tend to be limited. I know mine were before I read the Sacrament of Charity. Mm-hmm. And so this far, reaching and momentous vision that Pope Benedict um, lays out and and which was inherited by Pope Francis and he's expressed it in so many ways too. That I think will be a good centerpiece for people who want to think about the role the Eucharist plays in the world of politics. Great, thank you. It strikes me that in doing that work of reading documents together and discussing with one another, we're also potentially befriending one another, which I think is a constitutive piece of this work, which Holly, you mentioned. Being in communion. That's right. (laughs) Um, We have unfortunately come to the end of our hour. Um, I want to do a couple housekeeping things. You received a survey. Please, please, please fill that out. It really does help inform our future uh, work in this area. Um, Please keep an eye out for an email about our next episode. And I just want to add my thanks um, for our panelists for a fantastic conversation this afternoon and to our audience members for taking the time to join us. We're very grateful uh, for, for everyone's time. We know it's valuable and we, we really want to thank you for that. Um, so if we can give our panelists a hand, it's just me giving you a hand, but I'm doing it for 100 plus people. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon, everyone. God bless. Thanks.